technology is now used as an instrument of propaganda. I would like to congratulate the Olusegun Obasanjo Center for coming up with this. Uh, I must say that uh, Uncle Ray, as we call him, uh, provided a lot of input into this particular concept, and we like to appreciate him and Dan Abese. I'm meeting some of them for the very first time, even though I have read their works over and over and over again, all over these years. There are cases where I agree with them, and there are cases where I disagree with them. And I never had an opportunity to actually paste them page to page and voice out my disagreement. But my focus of research is not on journalism, but on media and cultural communication, uh, particularly the interface between media and culture and how cultural elements don't like the idea of media. And that puts me again in the hate speech category because I'm working on ideas that are not palatable to a lot of people. One of them is what I call the erotic hijab. Uh, the, the idea that how some Muslim women are now expressing themselves sexually on YouTube, expressing themselves in a very, very frank and open manner about what they want and how to behave when you go to the other room. And I'm not talking about the kitchen, okay? <laughs> or the living room, because we have three rooms in a house. Every house has three rooms. The other room, the kitchen, and I'm not the one who created this uh, concept. Uh, so don't blame me. Don't come and say that uh, the vice chancellor talk about this. Now they are coming out of the other room, but they are going into another room, which is a virtual room on YouTube and explaining themselves. And I thought this is a very interesting trend. I would like to capture it. But then I was told not to even think about it. Because if I do that, I'm going to be opening a can of worms. We would like to believe that women are desexualized. Women are just receptacles. Women have no opinion. They have no views about what they want. And therefore, we are very happy with that. But then they are now opening up and saying, no, we do have an opinion. We do like what we are doing, and this is how it is. And uh, some of my colleagues are saying, subhanallah, subhanallah, this is terrible, this is terrible, this is awful, this internet is bad. And yet on the same internet that allows this freedom of expression, we have what we call qara, Quranic recitation, that will show you how you can, you can pronounce the Quran very, very properly. We have biblical websites where you can get a lot of Bibles. So it is up to you. You either go to the bad side or you go to the good side. But you cannot undo it. You cannot tell people not to use it. Ocas, led by Professor Ungoa, has come up with this. He's an old journalist himself uh, and he's a friend. So it is not surprising that an old journalist invited old journalists to come and join him in this uh, particular activity. Uh, so I would like to congratulate Ocas for coming up with this. This is just one of a series of activities. This is the second one. The very first one was the inauguration of the center that was done under a different name by His Excellency Chief Dr. Olusegun Obasanjo, after whom the, the center is named. And I don't want to go into the politics of it, but I'm sure some of our guests will be wondering why are we calling it Olusegun Obasanjo Center. There's a simple reason for that. Number one, Olusha Gungo Basanjo is the first PhD candidate of this university. Yes, definitely. So we thought that we should honor him with that. Number two, I think for a very, very, very long time to come, Olusha Gungo Basanjo will be the oldest PhD student of this university because he got his PhD when he was 80 years old. Also, Olusha Gungo Basanjo got his PhD after serving as a president of the country on two terms. But if you look at it very carefully, historically, he was a president of this country three times, as a military ruler and then as a civilian ruler. And yet, that does not prevent him from coming to study. And one of the things he told us when we do, uh, doing the, uh, um, uh, the supervision and, and, and all that is, please, please, don't cheat me. Don't treat me like I'm a president. Treat me like I'm a student. And to us, that is humility. My view, I think the question that we should really be addressing and asking ourselves is, where are we? Um, there are things that we are normal just a few days ago. 
Suddenly, they are no longer normal. Uh, and I think to understand the abnormal nature of our environment is very fundamental to understanding why fake news has become so, what's the word to use? Why, why it becomes such an attractive menu? And why many of us, including myself, spend quite a lot of time on it? In part because either we've got very little to do that is important, or that there is very little out there that is sufficiently significant. I think this is one of the moments in the history of our nation, of our country, that we are so underserved in terms of what government is really saying and what it wants to say. And whatever anybody may say, the truth of the matter, philosophically, I've always been against the idea of a minister for, for information. In part because I believe that structuring information is a function of, it legitimizes not only citizens, but it promotes propaganda with the assumption that citizens are not capable of making up their minds. I think in my view that what government should be doing is to be able to give us the coherent information that we require to be able to make up our minds. Unfortunately, as we've seen in the last few uh, years, we've had a situation in which citizens have been chasing government policies and, 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 and uh, uh, reports. Is there a, a license for a full full day radio? Who was it given to? Somebody says to me, oh, it was just being discussed and suddenly, uh, is there a, a RUGA policy? It turns out, so really the point I'm making is that there is a huge information deficit. And this is what has made fake news such an attractive alternative for the rest of us. Uh, the second point is, you can look at fake news as theology, right? You can look at fake news as sociology. You can look at it as politics, as economics, as psychology, as anthropology. In my view, it's multidimensional. If you look at it as theology, perhaps the first fake news, no, not fake news, but the first hate speech was uttered by Cain. When God said to him, where is your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Um, but if you look at fake news and how it is fed and what really feeds it, it is the sociology of it. And there is a fantastic book. It was a popular study uh, by an American professor called Ted Gunner. The whole concept of what he called relative deprivation, which is that people in societies live by comparing their conditions with those of others. And when they perceive that others are benefiting more than them, the assumption is that you are better off because I'm worse off. And as a result, what then happens is that we, we set a society on this endless antagonism and so on and so forth. But if we look at hate, I mean, hate speech as politics or fake news as politics, then we also must understand that in a state of war, war strategists actually say that this information is a legitimate tool of war. So the point to make is that we must also be a bit more discerning because there is information that is going out there that is purposely just meant to distract us. And I think that here, this, one of the interesting things with this country is that, uh, you know, we are almost, we are very little, first of all, our thinking is linear. And secondly, we have very, a very short attention span. So there is a policy, we all disagree, form in the mouth, get excited, and then finally we go home. And we believe the problem has been solved. It's uh, amazing that uh, since 1979, we've been debating Sharia, and it has never improved in terms of content or quality or direction, until Babangira decided to shut it out in 1988. OIC, did we, we started in 1986, 87, Guardian, and so on. How did we end up? We have no idea. Ruga policy, we are debating how we're going to end up, we don't know. Somehow there will be a reprieve and everybody will go home until the problem resurfaces again. So I make the point, therefore, that if you take hate speech or fake news as politics, then you are the realm of propaganda. And philosophically, we must understand that the mistake we make is to assume that all everybody subscribes to democracy. And as we can see across the continent, and not least in Nigeria, there are people who actually subscribe to democracy simply because it is the only boss that was living in town. But their destination, their intention was completely different. So almost like in the case of you know, the fascist movement, that you have people who believe 
their principles are different and what their objectives are are different. But if democracy is what is taking us to where we are going, let's get on it, but our destination and our intention is completely different. So what do we now call fake news are multi-layers of conversations, but they are also feeding off our already existing prejudices. You know, I'm sure there are variations of this story about um, a bus that had an accident. You can choose the location somewhere in Obomosho. <laughs> and uh, the policeman goes and sees this uh, Adebayo who is hanging around. He says, oh God, you there here? When this accident happened, he says, yes, I did here, sir. So what did happen? The accident fatal. You know, that waiting be fatal. He said, like, people die. He said, no, people not die. Sir. Only three Gambari die. <laughs> okay. So, people not die. Only three Gambari die. And that is because for him, if you are Gambari, you are not a human being. But if you take that story, to Yola, which was told to me by Ayale, is that this bus driver is driving. Maybe it's Tunde, maybe it's Chukuma. And he stopped by the police. They said to him, this bus is overloaded. The guy looked, he said, no. He said, but how many people are here? He said, no, we've got 14 people and three Igbos. <laughs> you know, I mean, the point I'm making is, when you, when you take these stories around, you can replicate them. But when you hear bad things about people, you're already predisposed to listen to Then it, it, the story improves with telling. You know, take a simple story. Every time a, a, somebody who becomes an expert in gossip, every time gossip, you know, gossip moves from one leaf to the other, it increases the excitement. Have you had? Did you hear? And you have to, it will be boring if you tell exactly what it was that you had. So really, let me try and end by saying, look, what we're talking about, what we now call hate speech, has always been with us. And whether it is our colonial history, it also has intellectual legitimacy and justification. The Kiplings of this world, the Conrads of this world, the Jonathan Swifts of this world, that their intellectual contribution laid the foundation for colonialism. And with the assumption that somehow black people in that state it was legitimate to enslave black people. And we got to a point in which it was actually legitimate to do so because anthropologically evidence had been assumed to prove that we were less human. I think there are quite a lot of people that still believe so. And when you hear the things coming out of Trump, you know, you can say that we have not really covered a lot of distance on this journey. So finally. Can we deal with the issue of hate speech without denying ourselves the freedom of speech enshrined in the Constitution? Now, the question is, many people will say, and the literature out there insists, and I think they even made the point, do we resolve the problem by legislation? The truth be, truth be told, this is not a country of laws. That is the truth of the matter. Nigeria is not a country of laws. It's neither a respecter of laws. Those who make the laws don't respect the laws from top to bottom. This is what we are still debating, the Suki, uh, uh, Exactly, exactly. So at the highest level. So the laws exist, but somehow we are made to believe that it will be strange if you take them seriously. So the first thing to say is that we are not a nation of laws. But secondly, and I think almost as an ideological expression, are you legislating for or are you legislating against? We tend to legislate against. But I think that the business of law is to create a condition which, and I just read very briefly by way of ending, what Martin Luther King said in his great speech. You know that every constitution, if you read the speech, the, the, the Gettysburg speech uh, that was delivered by Abraham Lincoln uh, in November 19, uh, 18, no, 1763, you know, you will see very clearly that uh, a very short speech, less than 300 words, but it captured the philosophical basis for a new America. And when Martin Luther King delivered his I have a dream speech, I, I think many of us have done, go back and read the speech very carefully. And I just conclude by reading the, my favorite part of the speech. Because I think in the final analysis, his speech, whatever, the conditions are created by a combination of factors. Whether it's poverty, whether it's a feeling of helplessness, whether it's a feeling of despair, whether it's a feeling of not trusting the system or not trusting anybody. So whatever comes, and you know, the Bible itself says that uh, in the book of Revelation, you know, the most dangerous thing it says, you know, God says, you know, I, I, the reason why you are, I'm angry with you is that you are neither hot nor cold. Um, and uh, Bishop Cook has said that he could not um, disagree with uh, Mr. Ekul. 
And as a pension altar boy, I can't disagree with the bishop. <laughs> so we're in a transitive relationship here. I couldn't possibly add or detract from the keynote. Uh, I, I want to just focus on saying three things. One is about our framework, of hate speech, fake news, and power. The second is about fake news, hate speech, and enlightenment. And the third is the political economy of fake news and hate speech. Very quickly. First point, um, clearly there are no consequences to fake news and hate, hate speech, because if there are, um, Hendrik Vervoet would not have been Prime Minister of South Africa in 1958. Um, in 1943, he sued the Johannesburg Star uh, for calling him a Nazi sympathizer. And the High Court of South Africa ruled against him. He sued in libel. And he lost the case because the Johannesburg Star, the High Court actually found that he had been trading in what was called false news. Uh, next week, the United Kingdom is false news in support of Nazi Germany during the Second World War, by the way. Next week, the United Kingdom will install a man as Prime Minister who was a specialist in, in, in inventing news while he was a reporter in Brussels. And indeed, who was a specialist in inventing research material while he was a researcher for Michael Howard as the leader of the Tory party. Uh, and the United States president incumbent that is, um, published or uh, uttered over 10,000 verifiable falsehoods in his first five, in less than 500 days of office. So let's be clear, uh, you know, society tolerates these things when they are done by the powerful. Let me tell you my own personal experience. On the 15th of February this year, the governor of Kaduna State went on national TV to say that 16 Fulanis, on a Friday afternoon, 15 Fulanis, those were his words, 66, had been killed in a location in Kaduna. The security services, SSS, police at headquarters, Charles Ed, uh, House, knew he was lying. I say this because I spoke with them. I called them. And when I went on TV the following morning and said he was lying, they called me and said, thank you. I have them on record. <laughs> the security services called me to tell me thank you for debunking a governor who had lied about the massacre of Nigerians. 66, but it was not just he had lied about the massacre of Nigerians. He knew that by putting that out, he was endangering an entire community. He knew that the consequences of what he was doing were unthinkable, yet he did it. And in that month, I tracked hate against me. I stopped after 5,500 in less than three weeks. Yes? But I'm glad the hate published itself because then I could track it. I don't want hate I cannot track. So I love hate speech. <laughs> <laughs> Let us be clear about this. The governor enjoys immunity and nobody could do anything about him. I am here on bail. He, asked, he got an order of the Kaduna Magistrates Court to get me arrested. The only reason is the police know he's lying, and therefore the police are unwilling to become an instrument for arresting me. Those are the facts. But how many Nigerians are willing to go to jail? Prisons are built for human beings. And if you're not willing to go to jail for your convictions, stop talking about hate speech, and stop talking about fake news. If you're not willing to fight powerful people, when they deploy, my good friend Jim Omoshud never issued a press release as police PR that was not a lie. <laughs> that, Ruben, tell me I'm lying. Jim Omoshud never issued a press release as police PR that had facts you could have verified. On the contrary, he was issuing facts that were lies. Now we are here talking about hate speech and fake news by citizens. What do we do when government puts out falsehoods? But in reality, for me, fake news is all about deception in communication. It's a masterful application or manipulation of language, visuals, graphics, and things like that to achieve a predetermined purpose. Even though 
the more trivial element of uh, fake news, which Dan talked about, is to is to to uh, get more drive cells and drive drive traffic to your whatever it is. But the more sinister part of it is disinformation, and that's what we should be looking at uh, at, uh, at the disinformation. The disinformation of fake news plays tricks on the mind. Bishop Cook had told you many instances. For instance, the uh, the uh, President Buhari uh, second and all that. It caused internal dissonance. Even smart people could not tell the difference. That is how uh, the more sinister part of of fake news, which is disinformation, those pollutants of the news ecosystem, they cause tricks on the mind and they blur the line between falsehood and truth. And the effect is confusion. People lose their sense of judgment and in extreme cases, psychologically, imbalances, destabilizes people such that gullible targets go out to act on information whose basis in reality is very doubtful. And that is where, we, when we talk about um, hate speech. The confusion, the dissonance, the dislabilization, and the loss of judgment, the ability to make right decisions are precisely what the curators of fake news and disinformation aim to achieve. And that is how it happens that from their remote offices in Russia, in Iran, even in Lagos, curators of fake news manipulate and direct what people like and what people don't like, what they want to discuss. They set their agenda and they make, you know, decide what you think and possibly how you're going to act. There's this terrible thing that I can't pronounce in technology, the alog algorithms. <laughs> I can't be, I'll get an award when I ask. Algorithms, he reads the indi indicators of users' viewing behavior, what you do online. They read it, they monitor it, they see the contents, preferences of the user, what you like and what you share. And after that, they build a profile for you. And they start pushing that kind of information to you. And if you are someone that all you are reading are political things, things that make you angry, emotional reaction, religion, hate, and all that, they direct that traffic to you. And gradually, from those remote points, your behavior is being determined, being monitored, determined. And I think that this is my control. And that, for me, is what is most dangerous for developing society like ours. That is why I found the professor's speech about what intelligence services do, what nations do to each other, how people can forecast, OK, that you are not going to be in existence in 10 years. And then they begin to curate information and fire up people. Uh, when I was uh, looking through some data today, I saw that one third of the world's population is on Facebook. I also saw that some Israeli outfit, even as an experiment, had decided and tried and attempted to direct the outcome of the last election just using Facebook and manipulating behavior. And that is a more serious aspect of this fake news thing, this disinformation, we should be looking at how the behavior of a nation, of a people, are directed from far places, you know, by people who have predetermined intent and they manipulate you until you get there. Another thing that... Uh, 20 seconds? Huh? 20 more seconds. Yeah, I, I must say this before I go. Another thing I find interesting is uh, artificial intelligence, what it's doing. Somebody talked about uh, putting a woman on your back. There is something they can generate. Right now, they can take my voice, and they can simulate my, my voice, and they can curate words that I didn't say, and make it seem as if I said it, and that goes. They put babies on your lap. They can make a guy be kissing somewhere. And the artificial intelligence is growing sophistication. There is no type of falsehood that will not be possible using artificial intelligence in a few years. So we have to educate our people. They 
have to be aware that these things exist. Yeah, when Father Kuka talked about the passport, when I got it, I, I had just had enough. Too much of this hateful stuff, bad stuff, things are boiling up, are coming to you through the social media. And you know, we have to at some point maybe stop ourselves and, and relearn use of this media and be more discerning so that we don't, with our own hands, set fire on our own house and somebody will be sitting in Russia and laughing. That's how the US uh, election happened. That's how I think Brexit happened. And that's how so many more things will happen. And it is for each nation now to get their act together, to now educate their populace. And the media needs to do us a favor to work off their own the strengths of the of the real media, you know, we are living. With, we're losing momentum. We have lost momentum to social media, to the new media. Apart from uh, the online, um, you know, papers. What you call them? Premium Times and this other. Sort of, cable. Yes, cable. Nobody does investigative reporting anymore. We have to work up our standard. We have to work up fact-checking verification. We have to show the difference between the real media and the fake media. Uh, citizens, journal journalists, would be feeding. For them, just media premium. You know, all kinds of uh, labels, you know, uh, or creative whatever. Whatever they call themselves. But the truth of the matter is that they are making a lot of impact. They even call themselves influencers. And they are getting a lot of patronage. They have adopted an economic model that even appears to be more sophisticated than what you find in the uh, traditional mainstream media. And of course, these days, you know, many of the persons running some of these blogs, uh, particularly those just doing uh, cut and paste, or who are doing chit chat, or what uh, they may call uh, gossip or rumor, uh, you know, they are. They are being invited here and there and being called media giants. <laughs> and some of them are living in a, in a banana island. <laughs> and the people tend to trust them. They tend to go to them. And because of the uh, fact now that news has become democratic, everybody has a small phone. Once you have a small phone now, you are in the business of news. You can put anything on WhatsApp and it goes uh, viral. So it's a reality. Uh, that we may worry about, but we must also realize that it has its positive side. Citizens creating news led the uh, Arab Spring, you know, they provided information in some of the critical uh, circumstances which will appear to have deepened our democracy. The downside of it, of course, may be the fake part of the news and then hate speech. Now, uh, one point was made, and another point that I noted about the psychological dimension of what we're talking about. It's as if human beings like to just believe the worst. It's like Steve, you know, sensation, sensational stories. Sell more than the ones that are not, you know, sensational. And in a post-truth reality, uh, that just seems to be uh, the context in which we have found ourselves. And I agree absolutely with Chidi Odin uh, that leaders are part of the problem. And that perhaps if we have, you know, good leadership, responsible leadership, good governance, he talked about enlightenment, he talked about education. Perhaps we'll have a situation whereby the ordinary man, the ordinary consumer of news, will be able to make a responsible choice and choose that which you know appears to be true. Works. What works for us are not allowed to function. So they tell us what will help them get into office and then we listen to them. They bring a little money and tell us exactly what we need to, to do. And because, well, we are Marjorie's, we are uneducated people in a bad dorm, in a bar. We just uh, take the 3,000 and feel good, you know, that we are getting dividends of democracy. And then we become trolls, we become demons, and we grab our small phone and spread falsehood. That does not make it fake. It, it does not make it news. And I disagree totally with anybody parading himself or herself as a citizen journalist. Every opportunity I get, because I am trained to do what I'm doing, that is why I am called a journalist. 
there are no citizen engineers, there are no citizen pharmacists, there are no citizen doctors, there cannot be citizen journalists. So sometimes I get quite worked up with some of the people who are pushing this agenda. And it concerns me. So to me, and for those who I say, oh, these bloggers, because I happen to be a blogger myself. <laughs> Look, let's get a life. All of you high-powered journalists. You know, we live in the fourth industrial revolution. Somebody call it the, the hydrogen civilization, where the production of ideas, goods, and services are now at a marginal, zero marginal cost level. In fact, one philosopher called them the new prosumers. Not just consumer plus producers, prosumers. The same thing applies to news. There's a time when the big media houses felt they could now monopolize everything and control everything. And it's a global thing. So, okay, so I'll round up. So we now are in an age where a lot of people will produce uh, news. To me, and I'll round up some, the biggest problems facing Nigeria are not hate news, uh, hate, fake news or hate speech. They are not our problem. Our problem are number one, insecurity. Over 60,000 people have been killed in this country. Situations where the presidents of a country become sick and there's virtually no official and um, believable story about their health condition. What do the people do? How do the people interpret this situation? And one reverting example, and this has been a pattern, is in about December, not before I can remember the exact date, when the current president um, took ill, and for months, you know, there weren't very clear indicators exactly about his condition. People had to make up. And some of the people who feel up this are the people who are very dexterous, people who are outside the controls of power. Because in a very unfortunate sense, a great deal of Nigerian media have moved from being watchdogs to being lapdogs, you know, depending a great deal on news being fed from, from government houses. In fact, a lot of these news houses operate from government house, um, who are those who support some of them um, in different ways. That is not to say there are no critical press that is working. But a most fascinating one that demonstrates the imagination of ordinary people in response to people in power. And sometimes how they construct narratives to punish the people in power. To say, yes, you might close all of these official spaces, but we can also speak to power in our own way. It's the creation of what is known as a body double called Jibril. Jibril, the body double. Some of you here may be familiar with it. Who is Jibril? And why is it necessary to create a border double for Jibril? There's an absentee precedent, and the people have to have a way, based on the circumstances that they have followed with regard to his health condition, to say, we do not believe that it is the president. There has to be somebody else. Somebody, to use a certain kind of Nigerian rhetorical flourish, somebody tell us this is the president. That each of them is competent to deliver the, the keynote address at this colloquium. Uh, uh, thank you so much indeed. Uh, I'd like to request you, because of the effort, the brilliance, and the contributions of the panelists, to please. Rise and give them a standing But before we go for lunch, I'd like to call Professor Ibere Amudewe to please give the vote of thanks. Well, uh, actually, Dan has just thanked everybody. So, um, I'm a visiting fellow to this center, and um, I now appreciate what this center is all about with these kinds of gatherings that um, look deep 
into the problems that confront us and has the potential to derail this otherwise very great country. So I thank all of you for coming and contributing to the conversation. I thank Reb who gave us a very reflective opening speech and I thank all the respondents who have made great contributions. Thank you for coming. From the most populous black nation in the world, from the middle of Nigeria, from Plato, from Taraba, from Bainwe, from Kogi, from Nasarawa, and all the parts of Nigeria, comes to you information, politics, entertainment, news, and everything reality, infotainment, Tarafa TV, from home to the world.